I remember getting an interview for an assistant principal position, and it was not something I'd ever applied for before, so I didn't really know what to expect. When I got into the interview, what was interesting was about two to five minutes in, the principal and I actually started getting into an argument. It was really contentious. It was a heated debate. And as it was going on, I was thinking, this is the worst interview I've ever had. I can't believe this is actually happening. So I walked out of there. We shook hands, thanked each other for their time, but I knew it was going nowhere. About two to three days later, I got a call from the principal who then surprisingly offered me the job. And what he had shared with me was I was the only person who challenged him. I didn't just agree with him without thinking about what he was saying, but I pushed back and, and challenged some of his thoughts. And he said the role of the assistant principal, what was really important to him was that I wouldn't just let him make bad decisions without giving my input. Now, he did remind me that he was the principal and at the end of the day, he would have to make the final decision and I needed to back him up when we walked out of that office. But what he was looking for wasn't someone who would just say yes to everything, but would challenge him and make him think differently. That perspective really served me well when I became an administrator and became a principal myself. And the person I looked for was a person who thought very different to me. We had the same goals, but the way we would get there would be different. And that was someone who I looked at. So when we were looking at really kind of building a team, are we just actually looking at people who agree with everything that we're doing, are clones of ourselves, because that will be easier. But at the end of the day, is that better for the people we serve? Really great teams, they actually have a vision towards something that they're moving toward together, but then they also understand that every person on that team has different strengths, different viewpoints, and when we actually build that together, that's when we actually achieve the best results. I thought about all of this as I was in this conversation today with the superintendent and director of teaching and learning from Fruitvale School District in California, and I have the blessing to be out there. They have such an amazing school district, really powerful how they actually focus on finding the strengths of the people they serve. And I'm not just talking to the students, but the staff, but also bringing people together towards that common goal. You're going to learn a lot about literacy here, multi-tiered support systems, what they do that's brought them success. And I really appreciate it because I learned a lot from them as well. Uh, having the opportunity to go out there, not just about their district, but about things that I could be doing better in my work. And they really reminded me that when we actually build really amazing teams, how we do that is not by having everyone actually do the same thing, but tap into the strengths of each person to actually go towards one common goal. They do that amazingly well. I'm so excited you can learn from them the way I've learned from them. I'm so excited to actually join them all in Fruitvale. But welcome back to another episode of the Innovators Mindset Podcast. Hey everyone, this is George Kroos. Welcome back to another episode of the Innovators Mindset Podcast. I am so blessed to have Jasmine Basilius and Leslie Garrison from Fruitvale uh, School District, which I will be joining in, I think it's it's August uh, for your opening day. And uh, I actually, as I talk to both of you, I'm like, oh, I, the, I could only screw things up. <laughs> you can only, it's only gonna get worse after I come there because you're already doing really amazing things. Like I, I would just... There's so much that I learned from you. And as I'm, as I was asking you questions before we started prepping, I was like, oh, I need this recorded. So all I need you to do is just tell me everything you said when we <laughs> were recording and that would be amazing. So like, I, I'm really pumped to, to join you all um, just because I think not only because of the work that you're doing, but I can feel such a pride in your staff, which really <laughs> meant a lot to me. And not just talking to your teaching staff, you talked about everybody. So I thought that mm -hmm. was really meaningful. So I am, I'm really uh, excited to be here. So I'm going to actually just ask you both to kind of talk about who you are, what you do today and, and how you got there. So Leslie, if we can start with you, just tell us, you know, kind of what you do today and, and how you got to that point. So I'm currently serving as a superintendent of Fruitvale School District, a place that is very dear to my heart. But I began as a junior high school math teacher and I dabbled a little in special education. And then I moved on to a superintendent principal position, which was a wild ride, but it was great uh, learning experience for me. And then I spent about 10 years as an administrator at our middle school in our district, which was a beautiful place to be. I got to know our families and our staff very well. And so then I transitioned and this is my, I'm ending my fourth year, starting my fifth year as the superintendent. Did, did you start in 2020? Is that like, did you start there in 2020? Uh 
<laughs> that's like the that is like the year, right? That's the year. You either retired or you started. It feels like, or you jumped in. Yeah, <laughs> right. So people are like, "I'm out. I'm in." Like whatever happened that year. So I, the principal superintendent position—that's like a very interesting thing. I, I I didn't even know that existed, but here we are. It's right. <laughs> I, guess, I guess that's a thing. And so, um, Jasmine, if you can kind of tell us what you do today and how you got there, I also we'd love to hear about that. Sure. I'm the director of instructional services for the Fruitvale School District, and I went to school here. I went to Quailwood Elementary. I went to the Fruitvale Junior High. I am a um, English language learner. I was probably one of the unduplicated counts in terms of like low socioeconomic. I had all of those flags before all of those flags existed, and I feel very, very closely um attached to this district because I feel like that is where I got my foundation and where I grew from. And so I love being in meetings where now I run our ELAC meetings for English learners. I love telling parents I was here. I My mom was sitting in this crowd and I totally get what you're going through. So I love doing that. But prior to this role, I was a coordinator of instruction here in the Fruitvale School District. And before that, I spent about 10 years in special education in a different district. And I was a teacher in special education and in general education before that. Okay, so this I, this is a specific question for you, Jasmine. I'm I'm really sure. interested in what you're gonna say. So you actually grew up in Fruitvale, right? Yes. And so I I always find this interesting because um, sometimes, like I, I work with a lot of school districts, and you have a lot of staff grew up in that school, and there's this mm -hmm. kind of there's this kind of space like I came back because I love it. I don't know if I want things to change because I kind of love what it was when I grew up in it. But I'm sure there's a lot of changes that have happened, um, you know, since since you were a kid there. So, like, if you can think of, like, what's really one positive change that you've had in in the area from, like, when you grew up as a kid to the work that you're doing now. Do you, is there one that comes to your mind or is that like, no, it's exactly the same as when I was a kid? I think I think our demographics have changed so much in our district. When I was a student here a long, long time ago, my parents bought the house. So my parents moved to Bakersfield and they asked in their broken English, where is best school? Like, and that's where we bought the house because they wanted me to go to best school. And so I went to Fruitvale because that was where it was at that time. It still is one of the best districts in our county. But at the time, it was a very affluent area and I feel like now we have a higher um, percentage of students that are English learners, that are low socioeconomic, that have foster homeless issues, all of those things that maybe didn't exist when I was a child. But I feel like because I experienced those things before they were things, I can really connect with those students and those families. And I will say that one of the best things about Fruitvale that has been the same since I was a child to now is that all of the staff have always cared so deeply about kids. I felt deeply cared for as a child when these weren't categories, and I still see that in our staff now. Every time a student comes up and there's a need, everybody is hands all hands on deck. Everybody wants to help. Everybody wants to do what's best. And it's always the needs of the student before everything else else that has been the same ever since I was seven years old and I appreciate that you know so I grew up in a very small town in Canada and I always take such pride in it and I have a I have a bias I think a little bit towards it to to the small town community feeling in, in the sense that I felt that in some ways um we didn't have the same access to what you have in a larger center right and you know like your, your larger center is probably like in LA, San Francisco. I don't know the, the distance. I think you're closer to LA than you are the other way. Um, but mine was like Saskatoon, which is like 200,000 people, right? Like that was like huge to when we were kids. But I think there's so many new opportunities for our communities that we can tap into, but also the pride that we have. I, like I, this is one of the things, you know, people know me for innovators mindset, innovation, and it's kind of like they always think I'm just looking at the new stuff. But I think in reality, it's like, hey, what are some of the new opportunities that can really benefit our kids? But what are the things that we used to do that we need to like still hold on to and to kind of really focus on that like have worked that we shouldn't just move on because they're old, right? Like one of the things I've talked about over the years is I've really tried to correct myself when I would say like, oh, our traditional teachers. And it's like, there's nothing wrong with traditional practices. Are, are we talking bad practices or traditional practices? Are we just using those words in a chair, interchangeably? So I think that's a really important component. So I really appreciate that you you mentioned that because I think we're always looking towards new stuff to fix stuff, but some of the old stuff we're doing was really, really good. And uh, mm -hmm. we need to kind of hold on to it. So I, I do love that. Um, one of the things that you all mentioned to me um, 
was something that you're really proud of in your district is kind of your focus on literacy. And I know you shared a video with me. I didn't have an opportunity to watch it, not because I, I wouldn't watch it, but you shared it while we were talking. So I didn't want to make you watch me watching it. So I will watch it, but I'm going to link it down in the description down below for anyone can see um, some of the work that, in literacy, what's going on uh, in Fruitvale. So if either one of you want to talk about that, like what is what is the focus that you have with literacy kind of how are you approaching it and what are some of the results have been because i know you had mentioned um things are going in, in a pretty positive direction right i know we can always get better but i'm sure um you're very proud of how far you've already come jasmine i'm gonna let you answer most of this one okay okay um we have a goal of 95 percent of our students reading on grade level at or above grade level. And that's our goal as a district. And we uh, are attempting to do that again by looking at all of our students and being systematic about how we approach all of their needs. And so we know that collectively we're stronger than we are individually. So what we do every single day for an hour-ish a day, it's about 55 minutes, and it's school-wide, district-wide, our students receive targeted instruction and literacy at the level that they need every single day. And in order to do that, that means that if the three of us here are teaching in third grade and we have a fourth colleague, we all look at the data and we all differentiate what they need. I would be perhaps the intensive teacher who, for students who need intensive support. And then there would be a, a teacher supporting students who need strategic support, benchmark and enrichment. And we use all of that as based on data that we do as a universal screener. And we do that every single day. We use our aids to support so that our students that need intensive and strategic support can have small group instruction and give them more attention. And we have just found that that's much more effective than me by myself as a teacher trying to teach all of that range of students by myself and giving maybe one group 10 minutes here, 15 minutes here, and, and, and a lot of independent time for students. Now they're all getting targeted instruction. And what we're seeing is that the entire wave is rising. So our students that need intensive support have been growing, but our students that have been needing enrichment they're also growing as well. So the whole tide is rising. And so we're just seeing that our instruction needs to keep changing to keep up with our kids. And every time we set a higher bar, they meet it. So we're super proud of our students and, and our staff because they're constantly differentiating to meet the needs of our students. Yeah. I would add to that a little bit if I could, George, that the collective commitment of the staff, then that is all staff. That is our paraprofessionals are incredible. Our teaching staff is unbelievable. And their commitment to ensure that students receive that very targeted instruction that fits their need is, is amazing. So that's what's making this so successful. So one of my favorite quotes uh is from uh, i saw yang zhao say it and i'm probably i heard him say it so i might be messing up he said reading and writing should be the floor not the ceiling and why i love that is it kind of connected with me i was always kind of focusing on innovation right and i know that's really important is like really how do we create new and better opportunities for our kids and so i was so focused on that that i wasn't really talking about the, like basic skills that our kids actually need right and so i always use this analogy i think it it really connects with me is when you think of jazz musicians, the, the ones that are known for being the best have the ability to improvise on the spot. They, they can like create music and they're, but the reason they, are, they have the ability to do that is because they are so fundamentally sound that they've learned those things. So really kind of, as I'm listening to you uh, talk about this in your work, it's, it's not like, Hey, we're just going to end at reading. It's like, we know that if we actually have the kids with the ability to read and write, that it actually opens up doors to them no matter what level they're at. So the, the more we kind of focus on, you know, that floor, then we we actually vastly rise the ceiling, which I think is, is really, really powerful. So I, so I absolutely love that. Um, and Jasmine, and maybe Leslie, I'll get you to kind of expand on this too. Um, one of the things that you talked about, and I feel like I'm being a little selfish here because I am keynoting MTSS Conference in California. And I told them, like, I'm not the expert. I'm not the expert. So I feel like this is like a really great way for me to kind of learn more about some of the things you're doing. Because I think my big thing is I don't like telling people what to do. It's not my thing. I just share ideas with you. And then you got to kind of figure out what you're going to do with that information. Because I, I always default to the people in front of me as the experts. And um, one of the things that it really talking about how do you focus on your you know multi-tiered support system that you really focus on every student sometimes and i thought it was really interesting when you talked about 
And and Jasmine or Leslie, you can you can jump in on this. You talked about kind of sometimes we see the um, external, uh, we have external and internal things that we recognize. So how are you ensuring that like literally every student, every learner in your community is getting the support they need where they need it? So I can start. <clears throat> Some students, as we know, raise their own flag. They, they're, it's clear that they need support. There's something going on. We need to be curious and learn what they need and, and provide those supports. But then there's other students who may not raise their own flag and they may be quiet and they may have needs that we don't see. And so we have made a concerted effort to see all of those things. And so uh, Jasmine, you can explain if you want how we've connected our staff to all of our students. We have um, we we approach everything through that MTSS lens that you were referring to the multi-tiered systems of support. And so, what do we do at tier one to ensure that we catch every student and no one slips through the cracks? And so, what Leslie's talking about when she says raising their own flag, the kids with the externalizing behaviors we can identify, but we want to I, systematically identify students that have internalizing behaviors that we can't necessarily see or notice because those are the quiet kids. So we have um, meetings where we meet as a staff and we have our teachers look at their class lists and we talk about who on your class list have you not connected with recently? Who have you noticed has been more withdrawn or more quiet recently? Where do you see some concerns? Have you noticed any difference in behavior? And when you have uh, the power of doing that at a junior high school and you have multiple teachers across the day, if we're noticing a trend, you know, across multiple classes, or even if it's only in certain classes, we can ask the other teacher, what is happening differently in your class? But all of that helps us bring to the surface students that we maybe need to refer for counseling or have conversations with or talk about, do they need to see the social worker? And we don't want to miss those students because their behaviors are not, you know, the kids that are in trouble up in the office. So that's the way that we try to do that systematically. Um, there's also SEL universal screeners that they can assess and answer. And we use some of that a little bit too, but we find that this, you know, very um, close analysis of our kids in a systematic way helps us kind of make sure we're doing that on a regular basis. So this is perfect. Cause I'm just going to cut out what you said and just throw out my keynote and there's five minutes. Like I don't <laughs> have to talk, right? Like I'm like, here you go. You're giving hey, everyone. If you don't know what this is, Here's Jasmine, right from Food. You're Bell. giving us a lot of credit, George. Your keynote is going to be awesome, and we're going to be learning from your keynote. We know you have a lot to offer. So, hey, I so okay, I I loved I love what you're saying, and I when I was thinking about this in in having this conversation, I'm kind of kind of throw you all for a, a little bit of a curveball here. I I think the that MTSS model of what you're talking about, I think we sometimes are missing it with our staff. And it's like, we don't necessarily sometimes identify staff who we kind of think are doing really well and we don't pay attention to them. I'm not, and obviously I'm not saying you all, but and in fact, I would actually say the opposite. One of the things that I've really noticed in the conversations that we're having is everything seems like a, a huge group effort, right? Like there's a, a lot of connection between, but also like that's the same with students is like, how do you kind of balance? I and mean, I don't know if I'm really kind of asking a question or maybe just want you to kind of expand on this thought that how do we get to a place where we're really honoring the strengths and, you know, talents of individuals, even at the adult level while bringing people together? Because I think sometimes people kind of will shrink to be a part of a group as opposed to each one of us brings a gift that makes the group better. So like, how do you kind of find that is there like an MTSS model in how we work with staff or like even that thinking? Is there is something you want to exp I don't even know if I have a question there. I just, I just, that's yeah, what I, I said. I'm reading right into it a little bit. I, yeah. I would say yeah. that one of the biggest things is just to be curious. You have to ask. You need to ask people, how do they feel about something? Is this grade level working for you? Would you like to try something different? Your strengths we're noticing are with our enrichment students and you're really creative. Would you like to teach the enrichment group? Or we understand that you really can break down the fundamentals of reading. We would love for you to, you know, to, participate in the strategic group. It just depends. But the biggest piece is whoever the leaders are or the colleagues, you have to listen. Yeah. You, you know what? Okay, Les, first of all, your advice is amazing because it's, uh, what, there's like a, it's like it's OCHEM's razor. Sometimes like, it's like basically sometimes the quickest way to destination is a straight line. And it's like, we're always trying to figure out these like elaborate plans. It's like, why don't you just ask people? Yes, <laughs> just, just ask. ask. Them. 
like, hey, what are you really good at? Like, what would you really want to do? And it's like, mm -hmm. it, it seems like sometimes we just kind of miss the most obvious thing is like, hey, you want to build on the strengths of your staff? Instead of trying to figure them out, just ask them what they believe their strengths are and mm -hmm. actually start from there. And as you said, listen, okay. Okay, so this is now, this is going to put me on the spot. And I do love asking this question because it helps me kind of make sure that I'm supporting you. So I'm coming there to do your opening day, right? And now I'm a little nervous as I'm getting a little more about you. I don't want to screw things up. Seems like it's going pretty well. So if that, if, if I do what you hope I do, what do you hope I do when I join you all on that staff day? Oh, that's a great question. It is. A, uh, it depends when on you're coming in in August, everyone's excited. We're all excited to start a new year. We're going to try new things. The opportunity is very, very real right in front of us. So I would say to continue to build on that, give us encouragement, um, encourage our staff to innovate and try. Are we going to fail at things? Of course we are. But you don't learn unless you try and to have that growth mindset when we approach the year. Jazz, and I would just. I, go I, ahead. I was allowed to call you Jazz, just so you know. If anyone's you can call me Jazz. Not, not the other one. I can call you Jasmine or Jazz. I gotcha. <laughs> Sorry. I was just going to add on that, that it would just be a really great, it's such a great opportunity to see all of our staff and what you said earlier about us being such a collective team is true. We value every single member of our team and we know that every single person in our, in our whole district is contributing to the lives of students every single day in whatever capacity they're in. And so just recognizing that and reminding all of us of that, that we all work together, that we're all on the same page, working towards the same goal and valuing everyone that's there. I think that would be a great um, focus for that day as well. Well, and, you know, I, as I was talking to you all and we kind of talked about doing this, you're like, I don't want to do it right like let's be honest you didn't really want to do it and i and i actually can understand why it's because we're like hey we don't want to necessarily get the attention for the amazing things our staff are doing like we feel like we're leaving a lot of people out too but i think you really lifted them up i i just i i like i said i'm really excited it just seems like I'm, i have high very high expectations now i'm not gonna lie to you <laughs> I'm, I'm very excited to join you all so it seems like an amazing group but hey Thanks for being on the podcast. I know um, one of the things I really appreciate both both of you is you're willing to take risks and try something new. That I don't know if you've done something like this before, but to kind of do this in front of your staff, in front of the world. But I think uh, you're doing some really incredible things in Fruitvale, and I'm hoping that outside of your district, we'll hear some of these things and, and actually take your ideas and, and make them work for themselves. So thank you so much for being on the podcast. So it, I really appreciate your time. You're welcome. All right. Okay. Thank you, George. Thanks for your time. We'll see you all soon. Thanks. Thanks for everyone for listening. I hope you have a wonderful day. Take care.